Do you know the song, The Safety Dance? Yes, I do. It's like, you can dance if you want to, you can leave your friends behind, because your friends don't dance, and if they don't dance with her, no friends of mine. Hi, I'm John Stevens. This is Matt Russell. <laughs> this and this is your pod at Mercy. So, um, one of the things I've found in my life recently, how are you doing, by the way? You good? Yeah, I'm good. How are you doing? You, you are a saint. I'm not a saint. No, you no, are a no, good man. No, no, I'm just a good I had friend. my boost, my booster shot on Monday. That's Tuesday was not a good day for me. I had some, it, was, it just, you it kind of, good. no, it was just, just it was like my joints, all my joints were hurting. Is there, but you know, I don't know that that, I mean, to me, it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. It just meant my joints, like when I get flu shot, I get feeling bad when I have a flu shot. Right. But like then today I was, I was okay. You know, kind of got a good night's sleep and everything was good. And like joints are all good. Everything's fine again. Good. You know, and hopefully, <laughs> you know, COVID's not going to get me. Omicron doesn't Omicron care. Omicron don't play. That's true. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do my part, and li- I'm trying to listen to my doctor. That's what I tell people. It's like listen to your doctor. I'm listening to my doctor. Mm-hmm. You do you. I'll do me. But here, here's the thing. So, uh, in the last couple of weeks, my family and I have been watching this movie Encanto on Disney. Have you watched it I yet? Have not yet. You haven't watched Encanto. No. Have you all watched Encanto? All right. Well, you, you need you need to watch it. I mean, it's it's a beautiful movie, and I'm not going to give the Sunday. plot away. But it's about a house, a magic. Well, there's it's all this backstory. But there's this magical candle that creates this magical house, and the house gives gifts to the family members, the magical family members who the, who live in Colombia, and so they all have special gifts, right? And so the abuela, the mother, and there's three adult children, and they have grandchildren. But the three adult children, one who can affect the weather with her emotions and one who can heal people with food that she it's like cooks. the last airbender basically uh, mm-hmm. no it's without the fighting it doesn't have that okay. but then there's uncle bruno who's like not in the movie you don't know he's kind of disappeared and you realize um that the reason he's disappeared or he's not with a family or is pushed out is because he has this gift of prophecy he can see like what's going to happen to people, Mm -hmm. which is really good if something good's going to happen to you. Right. If I tell you, hey, Matt, you know, Friday when you buy that lottery ticket, lottery ticket, you're going to win. Scratch that thing. That's awesome. (laughs) But when I tell you, hey, you're going to be in a car wreck and you're going to be okay, by the way, don't worry, but your car's going to be totaled. You're going to go, I don't like that. I don't like that. That's not as good. So he's kind of disappears. We don't know where he is, but there's this song that has become the number one Disney song (laughs) of all time. Really? Yes. Since, it is a fish. It, considering all the Disney songs like that have happened. Anything from Frozen or whatever? It, it, yeah, more than Frozen. This Lion has become King. the number one no. Disney song of all time already. It's called What About... Uh, we Don't Talk About Bruno. We don't talk about Bruno. No, no, no. <laughs> and it's a great song, but it's like we don't talk about him. So what happened was this: we watched it one time. My kids were singing it, my, my, my daughter's singing it, and my son-in-law's doing the part with the guy, and we're at dinner, and I'm listening to it on Spotify, and I can't get it out of my head. I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning to go use the restroom, and all I hear is the song in my head. It's like you're in a black site, and they're just playing that over and it's, over. It's like, tor- it's like <laughs> torture. a torture syndrome. It really is. So I don't know, how do you get rid of an earworm? You know, an earworm is when you have a song that you go in your head and you kiss over and over and over and over and you can't get rid of it. How do you get rid of that? What's technique? Do you all know what the technique is? (laughs) Well, you say you replace it with another earworm. I tried that. So I put it on, I pulled up 80s on Spotify and went and it played uh, Men Without Hats, which is the safety dance, which I thought would cure it. I think, you, I think fentanyl is the only thing that gets rid of that. <laughs> so as a child of the 80s, the Men Without Hats, you know, that song I thought would replace it because that was an earworm. Do you know the song, The Safety Dance? Yes, I do. It's like, 
You can dance if you want to, you, you can, can leave, leave your, your friends, friends behind. Cause your friends don't dance, and if they don't dance with her, no friends of mine. And I thought, we can dance. And, she, and then the girl goes, on, on sing. Cause I think they're German. <laughs> they so we can dance, on the sing. On <laughs> sing. So I, I thought that would work, and it did. It worked for like 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden they get back, Bruno's and it's back. like. So what happened? Bruno again. So, uh, Bruno again. The, the, the soundtrack, the soundtrack is amazing. It's a really great soundtrack, but I, I need to figure out. Somebody needs to send me information about how to get rid of an earworm or a song that resonates in your head. The other thing I'll say is, in two weeks, we're going to have Dr. Mark Boom on our podcast again, who's the CEO right. and president of Houston Methodist. Mm -hmm. And Jeff, we need some way. We'd like to get input or questions, questions that people have that they'd like for us to ask Dr. Boom. And I don't know exactly how to tell people to do that. Make an email you. What does that mean? G Wood? G Wood, so if you email G Wood, G W O O D at chapelwood.org. Yeah, so email you. If you have questions, G Wood at chapelwood.org and we'll be glad to ask Dr. Boom. A lot has changed since we've talked to him. It's been a while. Mm -hmm. And with Omicron, you talk about, you know, the, the thing about like we wanted to get the vaccine and tell everybody to get the vaccine because like if you get the vaccine, you don't get COVID. And then all of a sudden, wait a minute, that doesn't work anymore. But maybe you don't get it as bad. And so there's all these questions you want to ask. And the thing about science is um, it kind of evolves. Mm -hmm. It doesn't kind of evolve. It evolves. You learn things as you go along and you don't know everything on day one. So... You know, we are entering the season of uh, what's called the endemic versus the pandemic, mm -hmm. where we have to learn to live with this thing. Wow. You learning to live with it? There's no choice. You right. got to. That's true. You got to live life on life's terms. And what are life's terms? <laughs> They're always changing, aren't they? They are always changing. That's pretty good. Well, the last couple of weeks when we've been doing this, and this is the last night we're going to do sort of here in the sanctuary together with the podcast and talking about this. You know, in, in different religions, they have this concept of these three understandings of there's the example, the path, and the community, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? The example for us as Christians is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we talked about his baptism and his temptation. We want to see what the example is, how we can take those characteristics unto ourselves and model those and implement those. The path is discipleship. We talked about that last week when we read in that passage of Luke 4 where he talks about the Spirit of the Lord is upon him right. and he preaches liberation and sight to those who are blind and release to those who are captives and liberation to those who are imprisoned uh, and this year of Jubilee. Mm -hmm. Which, interestingly, the Jubilee is taught in Leviticus 25. We talked about this last week. Jubilee is where everything is reset. So if you owed money, it's forgiven. If you sold your land, it's, mm. you get it back. If you're a slave, you're now set free, all these things. But there's no historical or sociological or archaeological record that the Israelites ever actually practiced Jubilee. It was taught, but it was never actually implemented. Hmm. What do you think that means? I mean, that's, that's, you think about that. If, if you're doing really well, do you want it reset? No. You know, so the, so usually the folks that are doing really well, maybe. I don't want to go back to, you know, high school when I was working at a car lot, washing cars. No, but maybe it's not that. Maybe it's just like, it's a little more even. Oh. Right. I'm okay with that, but maybe not everybody is. Yeah. But I also wonder, that's a hard thing to do because if you're way ahead, maybe you're also the one that gets to kind of set when the rules are. And maybe you think, well, we'll just kick this down the road a couple years and see. But maybe Jubilee in 25 more years, we'll see that how that works out. But I don't know. I, I guess for me, it's, um, it's a little, I'm a little bit more tolerant or at least willing to be accepting of when, when you read this and you talk about Jubilee and it's like, well, why can't we Christians do that? Well, the Hebrews didn't do it. Hmm. Nobody's done it. I think they expected that Messiah will, would come someday and kind of handle that, <laughs> right? And take care of everything. It, uh, Chuck Swindoll tells a story about a, a kids who had a treehouse club. And one of the kids said, we're going to have these rules for the treehouse. 
and the rules for the tree house that we're all going to agree to. There's only be three rules. And rule number one, no one gets to be too big. Rule number two, no one will have to be too small. And rule number three is everyone will be medium. <laughs> that was, that was everyone kids. is medium. <laughs> everyone will be medium. And that's the spirit of Jubilee in the sense uh, of yeah. how do we see one another? Yeah. So while socioeconomically we may not redistribute that wealth and that money in a way where everyone has mm -hmm. the same every 50 years and we just sort of redistribute that wealth, mm -hmm. I'm not really sure uh, people in the United States of America are going to go for that. Yeah. A lot of people would but not those on, on the top. But I think the spirit of it is how do you think about other people? How do you deal with other people? How do you treat other people? How do you view other people? And even if you have a lot of money in your bank account or you live in a big house, do you see yourself as someone who's bigger than someone else? Yeah, yeah. Or do you see everyone as medium? And what that means is that those people are actually the same as you, you know? Mm. Um, no one benefits from lording over other people. You may have more, but do you benefit from lording over other people? Jubilee is something that mm. benefits unity and well-being of the community. Mm. And um, I think that's important. Is whether we we not may not be able to live into the the reality specifically of Jubilee, can we live into the mentality of it? Mm. Yeah, I mean that's a radical thought to think that there. Are, what Christ wants us to do that the very heart of God is the is our social relationships ordered differently right and so that we we see each other and out of that seeing each other we have compassion and that that has a that has an economic response that has a that has a relational response that has an educational response that we respond in a way where maybe the church is the place <laughs> where people experience that when they walk through the doors I'm struck by this so if we talk about the example of Jesus and the path of Jesus, right, the liberation, an interesting thing we talked about last week is how Jesus goes back to his hometown and they all accept him and they want him to do what he's done for everyone else. Right. And they think they're going to get all the goody. And he tells the story that about the Israelites that says, you know, you're, you're, you think you are do all this and you're pref you get preferential treatment, but Elisha, Elijah, God's already shown that I'll go to those who are outside your circle. So wherever you draw your circle of who you think's on the inside of that, the prophets of God are going to go outside that circle. Right. And Jesus is going to go outside that circle. So think in your mind, who is it that's outside of the circle? You draw the circle, feel free, have at it. Good luck with that. Because when you start drawing circles, one thing I've learned, you can never draw them small enough. Mm. So when you start drawing circles and you think, okay, who's outside of my circle? Who would that be? Hitler? You always go to Hitler. <laughs> Hitler's outside. And, and what I'm saying is, um, Jesus is going to go there. Wherever it is, the enemy, the outside, the unclean, the impure, whatever it is that you think, Jesus is willing to go there. Jesus is going to go there. There's no place Jesus is not willing to go yeah. to reach somebody. Yeah. And That's right. so what happens is this whole new thing. So Jesus comes out of this. He's run out of his hometown, run out of his synagogue. They want to kill him. Mm -hmm. This is the thing that's interesting. You know, I think I grew up in my church. No one ever wanted to kill me. Like I was going to go into ministry and they were proud of me. I did some bad songs and some bad sketches and I preached some bad sermons. I don't remember anyone ever wanting to kill Running me. Running you out of town to kill you. No, no, no. no I, I don't remember that. But Jesus, they were willing to kill him. And so uh, what happens immediately mm -hmm. after this is he slips through the crowd and this whole next section is this really beautiful image of what it looks like now as you get to this third leg. So there's the example of Jesus, the path, which is discipleship, which is to be a disciple of Jesus. And then the third is to the community. What is the community? It's the church. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that look like? What's the rhythm of it? Who's in it? how you operate in it. And that's what we see in this passage of scripture in the rest of Luke chapter four, verses 31 through 44. So what we find in this is this little journey. This is kind of like what I like, um, the, the Beatles, you know, a day in the life. I woke up, I brushed my hair, 
That's a great song, by the way. If, I don't if, know. Maybe that could be your new earworm or wormhole. Or may, whatever maybe that would solve my Encanto problem. <laughs> that is actually so good. I did the Beatles, Paul McCartney. I'm going to do a day in the life of the Beatles. So this day in the life of Jesus, where does he go? So in in John, in, uh, in Luke chapter 4, 31, it goes, okay, so now he's done with all this. His family's running him out, hometown. He goes back to Capernaum. They were all mad about Capernaum. Why don't you do, to Caper- why don't you do here with what you your people? Did, yeah. What you did to Capernaum? Now he goes back to Capernaum, city in Galilee. He's teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were astounded by it. And he's in the synagogue, and there was a man with an unclean demon who cries out with a loud voice, leave us alone. You know, what have you to do with this Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and said, be silent, come out of him. The demon came out, threw him down, but came out without doing him any harm. And they were all amazed and they kept saying to one another, what utterance is this? What authority, what power? He commands these spirits and out they come. And the reports began to uh, be shared with him throughout the region everywhere that he went. So here's the beginning part of the day on the life of Jesus. It starts in the synagogue. It starts in community. It starts in the church. Hmm. Now think about the last two years, especially in 2020, where churches were meeting remotely and digitally, right? Joining with a gathered community is central to what it means to be yeah. the church. You, you've said this a lot, um, that we were not created to be physically distanced. Yeah. I, yeah, the way I, care, I say that is that there's no substitute for flesh. Hmm. Like, we just, we need each other, you know? And, and we, I mean, when we were preaching, you know, uh, from, a, from just this empty room <laughs> and we got used to it but it was no i never got used to it that's probably true but when folks came back there was like that i mean i was i cried yeah i i was like this is we're not meant to be we're not meant for that distance yeah yeah i mean in hebrews there's a passage in hebrews chapter 10 it said let it says let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Um, the message version of that from Eugene Peterson says, let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. He always keeps his word. Let's see how inventive we can be encouraging in love and helping each other out, not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spur each other on. There's this sense of encouragement and engagement when you come together. There's something about church on Sunday mornings. I don't think whatever happens in the post-pandemic world with all the digital cameras we have here and the ways that we're reaching people that we can't reach in the same way that we used to, you're never going to replace people being in a room together. Absolutely not. You're never going to replace a Sunday morning or a Saturday night or whatever it is with people being in the room. I went to uh, Mercy Street Saturday night, Mm. which is one of our communities here, and to see people that I haven't seen and to hug necks and everything, even with their masks on, right, was just really amazing to see and sense that encouragement and to know that here are people who are struggling with addiction, Mm -hmm. they're struggling with mental health issues, they're struggling with just people who feel like they haven't been like included or Mm -hmm. don't fit in a, in a church culture and they come together and they, they, they look different and they feel different and they talk different, but man, they're family. Yeah, that's right. You know, that's right. And the church is a belonging system that is really, I think, a counter narrative to all of the divisions that we talked about, that you talked about last week with the, if Diablo, so that root word is to divide up. The church is this grand belonging system that says, oh, you, we're so glad you're here, Hmm. right? And it's not, you don't walk through the categories of the hoops you've got to jump through. The church is, is the belonging system that is a counter narrative to all of that which isolates you know related to mercy street this so so in this passage there's a a bunch of different things in this passage of scripture 
in in Luke 4, beginning in 31. So he goes to the synagogue, so he mm-hmm. gathers together. He seems to do this in, in every single place that he goes. He's right. willing to go. He wants to gather together with people, mm-hmm. whether it's in the synagogue or in a Pharisee's house to eat dinner or in Mary Martha's house. Yeah. He wants to be together. You know, uh, Jacob Rees, he used to be a part of our community of faith, he used to always talk about parties. You know, he talked about the three pillars of what it means to be the church. One of them was parties. <laughs> You know, it was the social aspect. It was the gathering together. And in the way that he gave that flesh was to say, the kingdom of God is about having parties together. So you think about the the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, you know, when the prodigal son comes home, they have a big party. You know, they kill the fatted calf and they, and they get together and there's all this other drama that goes on, but they have a big party. And the scripture says when someone comes to know Jesus, you know, the angels celebrate and sing and there's this big party and the sense of celebration and coming together. That's Mm. a part of what it means to be the community in Chapelwood. We have, have you been to second Sunday lunch chicken? Oh yeah. You've done this. Oh yeah. Have you all done this? Because I think there's something about like on the second Sunday of the month after church, after the second and, and third services, we have like oh. fried chicken and meatballs and baked chicken and meatloaf and mashed potatoes and green beans, and, green and, beans and, bacon. And, and I haven't had dinner yet and I'm hungry. <laughs> and, but what's Those really biscuits. special about it is while the food is amazing, there's something about, and even though I'm totally exhausted, I mean, I've been here yeah. since early, I've done three services, I've greeted everybody and I go sit down in there, but there's something about sitting in the table yeah, with that's people right. That's right. and people coming to you like, uh, last month we're sitting at the table and we're eating, I'm eating my fried chicken thigh, right? It's <laughs> grease coming down. And while that's happening over food, there's a lady telling me a story about her family and she's shedding tears, mm. right? About just wanting to tell the story of the things that are happening in her world. Mm. And I think to myself, when has she had the opportunity to share that in a deep and meaningful way, if not That's around right. a table, table, around food? This is what Jesus does. This is a part of the rhythm of the community. Mm. And I wonder, I guess the question I have is I wonder does, how does this pandemic um, life or now endemic life disrupt that which is so integral to the part of mm. being community? To just gather together to have meals, to pray, to laugh, to smoke a cigar, you know, have a glass of wine, to have a party at your house. Someone invited us over to the house to have dinner last week and just to sit and just you know, be in the room in someone yeah, else's yeah. house and visit is, is a beautiful thing. I wonder how, how that changes going forward. I hope it doesn't. Well, I also wonder if that in, in the quarantine, if it, if it heightens the fact that we really, those are, those are relationships and times we have to cultivate, right? And that we have, we can't let go of those. That, that's what's, that's where life is made, you know? Um, I think if I could go back and I think about even like people that have gone on before us, I think about my mom. I mean, I would love to go back and have a dinner with my mom. You know, Mm -hmm. it's not like I'd like to go back and run errands with her or, you know, be efficient. You know, I want to sit down over a cup of coffee or a a dinner. And I think there's something about those unforced rhythms that happen around a dinner table. I have learned so much more during the pandemic to appreciate quiet nights at home with my family. Mm -hmm. Although my kids are grown now, but, um, you want when, some of mine? No, no. <laughs> Drop off some boys. No, I, I've been <laughs> See there. See how and, quiet those uh, nights I've are. I've been there and done that. I'm good. <laughs> I, I will, I will pray for you. How yeah. about that? Thanks. Thoughts and prayers. That's exactly what I need. <laughs> in the name of, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> <I give you. laughs> no, but I mean, the, the, it, but you, but you know disease. what, here's, here's the thing. So I thought the same thing when I had kids in my house, mm. especially when they're teenagers, teenage girls, and you got boys, but I'm going I'm to tell you something. And some of y'all out here know this when they're gone, as difficult as some of that stuff was, it, you miss it, don't you? Yeah. Well, I mean, those right. moments That's you miss it because they were hard from the pit of Satan <laughs> right there. I'm telling you, it's not. <laughs> okay. And, and you know, everybody's had their tough moments and their yeah. tough situations. Um, but I, I think 
you do. Yeah. You, 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 but you graduate. Like I'm the kind of person, my wife is, is Stephanie is the kind of person who like wants to keep all that and bottle it in the living room and just live it for the rest of eternity. And I'm the kind of person that's like, this is the natural order of things. This is yeah. the stage it takes. You know, Toby, you got a grandbaby now. I mean, like you wouldn't trade that for anything in the world, would you? I mean, no, of course you wouldn't. But it's a very different situation than 10 years ago for you. Yeah. And so you lament like, it's not the same with your kids, but there's something beautiful that happens. And I look forward to like the beautiful that's going to happen. Yes. Even though it means I'm going to be getting older and, <laughs> and, things, be cool grandpa, and things shape. No, I don't know about that. You will. I think I'm going to be a curmudgeonly grandfather. Yeah, right. like, get your, get off my lawn. Get off my lawn. <laughs> Pick up, you're the putting a ring Torino, on the table. The Grand Torino you're grandfather. You're putting a ring on the table. Get your drink. Where's the coaster? All right. <laughs> you're not going to be that guy. <laughs> One of the things that's interesting, so Jesus goes into the... Um, that's right. We're in the Bible study. Yeah, we're doing a, we're kind of doing a podcast around the Bible, but we're, we're getting close here. We're, okay. We got. I, I think this is the day in the life. So he goes to the synagogue. There's this natural order of just living life together. Now, while he's there, he sort of he has this power over these dominions of these spiritual forces of evil. There's mm-hmm. a man who is uh, possessed by a demon, right? And so he casts him out in this place. He engages people who are held captive. Yeah. That, I think, is something consistent throughout the gospel. So when we think of a day in the life, so he's gathering together a community, but he's never going to stop from his uh, mission we find in Luke 4 that it's about liberation. So I think whatever you're captive to, in, in this particular story in verses 33 through 37 in Luke 4, he is engaging with someone who's held captive by something, captive by a spirit. Yeah. And the spirit is not a spirit of God. The spirit is not a spirit that is allowing this person to be all this person is created to yeah. be. Yeah. And this is ministry of liberation that Jesus is always about. Mm-hmm. He's going to look for who needs to be set free. And so when I think of all of us who are Christian or maybe we're not Christian, or maybe wherever you are on the spirituality scale, on the spiritual scale. But if you're Christian and you've got some parameters around what you think is right, you know, who's in, who's out, who's right and wrong, just let me tell you something. Whoever needs liberation, that's where Jesus is going. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's gonna be outside that circle you draw. Yes. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, always. Because Jesus comes to set free those who are held captive. Yeah. And I think in the same way, I would say to someone who is not a person of faith or struggling with spirituality or dealing with things that they might be captive to, know that this Jesus, this God, is a God who says my mission is to liberate yes. people who yeah. are in captivity. Yeah. Like a real practical way that I've seen that happen is that like say in, um, like in AA or the, the different recovery groups, there's some churches that want to kind of baptize that in the name of Jesus and bring it into the church and say, it can only happen in the church, right? But we understand that if the Spirit of God has been poured out on all flesh, mm. that the very Spirit of God is in the world liberating people. And there's only one name by which we're liberated, right? And so we see God liberating addicts in different places. I mean, that, underneath that, I understand that to be the liberatory presence of God, right? Whether it happens inside of the church or outside of the church, there's only one presence that can liberate. And I think then the church doesn't have to think about trying to brand itself on all these movements, but, but to participate where they see that happening and, and, and go there, yeah. you know? I'm not saying those, you shouldn't have AA, you know, like celebrate recovery and stuff. I'm just saying Jesus is everywhere. But this is the thing I would say to people who qualify themselves as spiritual, but not religious. Mm-hmm. And they're not involved in church right. is the reason, you know, churches have, we have not done a good job as a church to present God in a proper way to people yeah. in the world. I, I don't think because we've, You know, there's this theological term we talk about reify and, you know, which is like we, we give value to something or we give substance to something that has no substance. It's like grace, like we dole out the grace. (laughs) So we reify it, right? Or we reduce it. And we say there's only so much. Yeah, no, no. (laughs) It's so, so those, so the two theological terms, the two R's that we would, we reduce things, all right? There's not enough for you or we reify it and we say there's. 
uh, substance to something that has no substance. So grace has, now we have something, and we're the ones who control that substance. So we're gonna reduce what the, what the definition of grace is, but we're also gonna reify it in the way that says, you know, you, Oak, will you live this kind of life, or you do this kind of practice, or you've had this kind of experience, or this kind of background, no, you're, you don't qualify for grace. And so people who are spiritual, not religious, that are not involved in churches, they've heard this from yeah, churches. Yeah. And I'm just telling you, it's a total heresy. Absolutely. Because churches cannot reduce the gospel. We also can't reify mm. things mm. like grace and yeah. mercy and love. Yeah. We don't get to do that. And yet we've done it. And we've told people that we can do it. And they've believed us. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have people out there who are very spiritual people. So I'm going to have nothing to do with organized religion. I'm going to have nothing to do with church because you have controlled this, this, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? This asset or this, um, resource, mm -hmm. right? You control this resource and I don't have access to that resource. So screw you. I'm not having anything to do with you, right? right? I, I, I'm gonna figure it out some other way where there's not a limited barrier. And what I wanna tell people is the church did this wrong. Yes, We did it wrong in the 16th century, which is why Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation because the God, I love Catholics. Anyone who's Catholic, if you're Roman Catholic, God forbid you, I'm sorry. But you know, they, they got corrupt and they were selling indulgences. They said, you want grace, you gotta pay me and I'll give you this little piece of cloth that says you're forgiven. That is not what no. Jesus is about. No. And I would say even the modern American church, when we use some of that same stuff, it's like you're holy enough or you're not holy enough or you do this or you do this. It's not at all. And so this reducing the gospel and reifying these things like grace and mercy and love and joy and all these kinds of things have run people out. So they're gonna go find spirituality somewhere. Yeah. Because everyone is designed, everyone is created to be yeah. connected to something bigger than themselves. But they're looking at churches and going, I, I don't have anything to do with that. Yeah. I don't blame them. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to see this in the, in the text uh, of this week in that the, when, when Messiah shows up in the synagogue, the religious people don't recognize who he is. It's the demons that do, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's the demons that say, you're the Messiah. So he's in, and he, he, the he has to God. cast him out quick enough because he's like, he's like, you're the Messiah. You're the Holy one of God. He's like, whoa, 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 time out. Don't say that. Don't, yeah, don't, don't make a big deal out about that right now. We're not there yet in the story. We're getting there, but we're not there. But the very same, the very folks that are anticipating the coming of the Messiah when he shows up, don't recognize him. Mm -hmm. Won't, won't receive him. And it's the, it's, it's out of that very darkness. that says, nope, that's him. I know, man. It's just, I just, I, I, my heart breaks for people. So many people I run into who are not in church. And I think of some people who now have been coming to Chapelwood who are not in church, but somehow connected somewhere and, and uh, somewhere, whether it's the podcast or through a relationship. Mm -hmm. And someone in this church said to them the same words, like all that stuff that you've been fed, that's not that's Jesus. Not no. And people are like, okay, well, I'll give this a chance. And they're coming and they're realizing there's something different. Yeah. You know, I don't have to go do the spirituality on my own no. because I do think the community is very important. I think the church is Absolutely. important in, in the, in theological terms, we use this theological word called ecclesiology, which is the theology of the church. The theology of gathering as the church together. There's a deep beauty to that, mm. which is about what Absolutely. we're talking about, human connection. Absolutely. And yet it's become so corrupted and controlled by humans who are broken and they mean well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I may be I may get broken and isolated alone. I can only heal in community. Um, it, it is the church is a we program. It mm. is not a me program. Right, and I will be wounded alone, and my my wounds often will isolate me. Um, and the lie is that I can somehow get fixed in a closet somewhere, you know, by myself. Um, that's a lie. I have to always be brought back into relationship because I think that's where, when Jesus says the two or three are gathered in my name, that's where I'm at. That's where I am, and so that's where healing takes place is in those relationships. That is so good when you say you can get, what is it you say you can get broken in isolation, but you can't be healed mm -mm. in isolation. Mm -mm. 
I have to sit with that for a while because I think about my, my own journey in the last two years and the thing that really liberated and set me free had to be done with working with someone else. Yes. Yes. I couldn't do that on my own. I yes. tried to do it in, I tried to do it on my own for a long time. Mm-hmm. I couldn't do it. Mm. And I, I think of myself as a pretty resourceful person. If anyone could have done it, John. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not saying <laughs> I mean, that. No, but, but, I, but I've always been able to dig myself out of the hole, sure. right? I've always been able. I've always been able to make a way. I mean, if, if mm. you know, if, if anyone knows my story, it hasn't been an easy story, an easy road, and yet I've always been able to make the way. And yet mm. this time it was like I can't do this on my own. Mm. And there's this this humility of just laying down, saying, "I need other I need other people to pour into me to speak yeah, to me yeah. and, and to work in that way." And, and so when you think of you continuing on real quick in this life of Jesus, so he does this and he's in there with everybody and he does it. But when he's in the synagogue, he's in the community. But then he makes this move to the house of Simon Peter yeah, yeah, yeah. and heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law who's sick with a fever. Uh, I was joking with the staff. I read this. I said, Simon Peter's mother of the fever and King Herod initiated the mask mandate. No one over 10 people could meet. No choirs could sing, but that's not what the Bible says. And it says he, he has dominion not over the spiritual forces of evil, but he also has dominion over the physical forces of sickness and disease. Mm-hmm. So he does this spiritual exorcism. Now he's going and he's dealing with this physical aspect. And this is when we do a healing uh, prayer service in the Methodist church, when we anoint someone, we say, you know, I, I pray for healing in body, mind, spirit, and relationships. Mm. That's the, what we say. So I, I was a part in college for a, long, for a couple of years, a part of a real Pentecostal non-denominational church. And they would anoint you to pray for your physical healing. And if, if you didn't get healed, it's because you had some sin in your life, yeah. something that you'd yeah. done wrong, yeah. you know, and you didn't, and you didn't even know what it was, but until it's you there, figured it out, in there. <laughs> until you figured it out, you're not going to be okay. But I, but what I always remember when I went into the ministry and I looked at the book of worship and we had a healing service, I was thinking about the anointing of oil and just mm-hmm. kind of praying for the body, the body, the body, the body, the body, the let, you know, get up and walk, get up and walk, get up and walk. It's gotta happen. The same miracle can happen, yeah. the same miracles can happen. And I saw this liturgy and it said, body, mind, spirit, and relationships. Oh. And I was like, man, this makes sense now because yeah. I know people who are in wheelchairs who are more whole people and more healed people than people who can walk. No, oh, yeah. So healing was for me much more than physical, yeah. but Jesus does physical, spiritual, mind, body, spirit relationships. That last one kind of gets thrown away because we think of my, my, my body. I wanted my body to be healed, my mind to be healed, right. my spirit to be healed. But man, how many relationships need to be Come on. healed? And to, to include that, it's like, I, I get annoyed. It's Jeez. like, we pray for healing of mind, body, you know, body, mind, spirit, and relationships. That's when my eyes go, well, now, time out. We're across. <laughs> you're like, you're, you're, you're meddling now because yeah. there's some people I don't know that I really want to have my relationship healed, healed. with them. Yeah. All, you know, reconciled. Anyway. I also think it's interesting that um, Peter asks for Jesus to heal his mother-in-law. Can we just let that sit there for a minute? Yeah. They had a great relationship. It was really good. I'm, I'm not even going to go there because this is being recorded. This is <laughs> good. So the last thing I'll say is there's the, the rhythm at the end of the day. So at the end of the day around sunset, so now he's healed. He's been in the synagogue. He's done the community. Power over the demons. Power over the physical healing. He goes to the home. He goes to a smaller network. But now everyone knows and the whole community is coming out. They all want to be, it says at sunset, all the people come to Jesus. They bring everyone with them, all the people with sickness, laying on hands, and he heals everybody. He's working hard, like he's touching folks and healing people, and demons are possessed, and they're like, you are the son of God, and all of this is happening. Mm-hmm. And then it says he goes to break, he goes to bed, and at daybreak the next morning, it says in verse 42, Jesus goes to a solitary place. Mm-hmm. He talking about the rhythm of a day, day in the life 
not the Beatles, day in the life of Jesus. He departs. He goes to a deserted place. All the crowds are looking for him. They finally find him. They, they catch him. <laughs> they want to prevent him from leaving. He's ready to go to the next town. want to prevent you from leaving. He said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom to other cities. For I was sent for this purpose. I wasn't just sent to stay here. I'm not sent here to just be located. Mm. But I got to go to other places. What I love about this, what's given me some permission in my own life, is to take those cycles of rest and break to be to move into a solitary place um Mm. i don't think that's easy for us to do in the rhythm of our lives but when we think about in the day of the life of jesus there's a lot of hard work that happens there's a lot of love there's a lot of conquering over you know spiritual forces and physical ailments Mm -hmm. and then there's so much more to be done I think about that in my own life. It's like, how can I go away? How can I take a break when there's so much more that has to be done? I think all of us ask ourselves that question. You know, I wonder if Jesus is able to do that because he realizes that his ministry isn't to people. His ministry is to the Father, right? Based on his own identity. Because if his ministry was only to people, if they, if, if people set the agenda, then it's people's agenda that have to be met. But if it's God's agenda... Because I, I, my hunch is, is that there were people in that town. He didn't heal all. He did you know, heal everybody. He moved on. He moved on. There were probably there were they were seeking him. There were still people that needed something from him. Yeah. And he went to the next town. Mm. That doesn't sound like Jesusy. <laughs> well, at least the way that I've been told about Jesus. Right. Right. But that's what the scripture says. Yeah. I, and in some ways, it's, it's hard for me to understand, but it's like, it's liberating. It's like this regular practice of Jesus. It highlights not just in Luke, it's in Matthew, it's in Mark, it's in John, that Jesus is not constantly engaging crowds. He's not in continuous interaction, even with his own inner circle of disciples, yeah. right? Or with masses of people. But at those significant moments of life, he pulls back, he withdraws right, from the press and the pull of other people to have some time alone in silence and solitude with his father. He's going back to remember those words at his baptism that we talked about. Mm -hmm. You are my son, my beloved, and you, I'm well pleased. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't ever, if you don't ever engage in the cycle where you stop, when do you hear that again? That's right. You're not going to hear it. It's going to be, it's going to be convoluted. It's going to be drowned out. Yeah. You know, in Jubilee, when you talked about um, the ground being left fallow so that the nutrients could come back, I wonder if that's what solitude does for us personally. If it lays the ground where we're not producing so that we can be restored, the nutrients of our soul can come back. And if that's partly why Jesus was involved in those rhythms was about his own Jubilee. You know, he says in the Gospels, it says, I only do what I see my father Father do. And I only say what I hear my father say. Mm. How in the world Mm. is he going to know what his father says and does if he never spends time with them? Yeah. Right. You, you don't know. Mm. How do you know? How do you cultivate a marriage if you don't spend time with your spouse? How do you cultivate a relationship Mm. with friendship if you never spend time with that friend together in in those moments you know this is an essential part of who jesus is and it has to be an essential part of us this has really liberated me i think in the last um two years especially in this because i've been spending a lot more time thinking about this Mm -hmm. it's like i i remember when i came into ministry as a young pastor like about 30 years ago now and the older pastors who were who were at the end of their ministry so think about that i came in and you know in the early 90s so think about folks who were 40 years in ministry in the in the early 90s go back that's got to be what 50s yeah that's like the yeah All right, so they just think culturally right they wake up on saturday morning they put on their tie and their white shirt and they mow the grass <laughs> gilbert ramsey god bless his His heart was a district superintendent, pastor of large churches in South Georgia. And he would wake up on Saturday morning, he'd put on his starched white shirt, his tie, and he would mow the grass in a white shirt and a tie because you couldn't let anyone see you 
not looking that way. Right, right. And I remember this old guy, Veal Daughtry. God bless these. I think Field's still alive. And I remember him standing up at annual conference one year, you, you know, just with this celebratory statement. It's like, I've been in ministry 40 something years and I have never missed a Sunday. And like, on the one hand, I want to go, man, that's like really impressive and awesome. And for his day, that was like a feather in your hat. That was a celebration. Yeah. But I'm looking at well this done. going, I don't know that this is what I want to do. Mm. I mean, where's the rhythm, right? Where's the rhythm? But that was a badge of honor for that generation. Yeah. You don't miss. If you take a vacation at all, you might go, you know, someone would, you know, back then they also made, like, preachers don't make a lot of money, but back then they made, like, no money. 13 cents. Yeah. And so <laughs> someone might give you their house, right, at the lake house in, in Milledgeville, Georgia or something. Why don't you go stay at our house a couple of days? And you feel guilty if you go more than like two days, two days to stay at the house. You feel bad because you got to be at work because there's people in the hospital and I got to go see them. Yeah. It was this compulsion, but even Jesus pulls away, right? He's not constantly engaged with people and he even walks away from a town where there's still people that have needs mm -hmm. that's a hard thing i'm still processing kind of how to really make sense of all of that but i do know that this is a rhythm that i have to pay attention to well, i wonder like it with our own kids there's times in which if i mean if if jesus is to be connected to the father and the Father sets the identity and the agenda and the ministry of Jesus, and I'm only doing the things that my Father is doing, then I wonder if, if then that, that sense is that um, the community around the other people, I mean, when Jesus leaves, it's in a sense that he's setting up Jubilee. He's saying this is how it can be. Take care of each other. Hmm. Be for each other. Uh, order, order your relationships differently. This is, this can be different if you allow it to be different. And I'm showing you the way that sin takes us back towards chaos from creation. And when Jesus is central, there's always a move back towards creation, back towards a new thing. And I think that that's, that's possible, right? So mm -hmm. even if a person's not healed, like you had said, maybe the relationships in that, that setting can be restored, right? Yeah. Um, so I... I don't know. Well, you know, and the last thing that's there at the end of this in this passage of scripture is Jesus reengages. And I think this is important too because when I hear this message that it's okay to like move into solitude and silence and separation, the past two years has I've, I've always been a really big extrovert. I love being around people. I want to go to parties. I don't want to miss anything. Man. <laughs> pandemic cured me of that it's like I, I get up in the morning and i'm like i don't want to go outside today it's too it's too peoply out too there people it's too peoply yeah. out there and it, what happens is you have to have that rhythm of solitude yeah. and silence yeah. and spending time with the yeah. father but you have to re-engage the danger for a lot of us as we've and it's not everybody but for some people is we've pulled back we don't want to re-engage there's a lot of people who don't want to re-engage. And I'm saying that also is, is a, is a, is a fa fallacy yeah. that you can't live into. Um, you can't hide away. Mm. I think the, the hermits and the monks that went out in the desert and lived by themselves, they were not following that rhythm of that 24 hours we see in Luke 4 of Jesus. Right. He did pull away solitary. And re-engaged. But man, as soon as that was done and he had was recalibrated he re-engages and it says and then he went to proclaim in all the synagogues throughout judea mm -hmm. so this pattern what this little uh, section in luke uh, luke 4 31 through 44 whatever is almost like a day in the life of jesus it's a rhythm mm -hmm. right and it's repeated all through his life okay and so it's this like you know gathering with the community I'm going to go to the home and be with those that are closest to me. I'm going to liberate from spiritual forces and from physical forces. I'm going to go back out into the neighborhood and I'm going to heal people, whatever. Then I'm going to pull away and I'm going to need some time to myself to like refocus on my father and kind of recalibrate and hear once again what I'm about, what the father wants me to be about. So that if I'm going to say what the father wants me to say, I need to listen to the father. Mm. And then he comes back and he goes, 
because I would be right there. That'd be me. I'd be done. I'm like, I'm just going to stay up here on the mountainside. I think I'm finished. <laughs> and Jesus is like, no, we got to go re-engage again. And that's when I started going, wow, I don't want to re-engage <laughs> again sometimes. But I think that's the, um, th- this is what it means to be the community yeah. is engagement, mm. the, the practice and the rhythm of life of day in, day out. Where is, I, th- I think what's interesting to me what, as I'm shaping this for Sunday is what is this rhythm that includes community of the church, family, because he goes to Simon Peter's, he goes to Peter's house, Simon mm-hmm. Peter's mm-hmm. mother's and mother-in-law's house. And then there's like, the, there's the church, there's the household, then there's the broader community. Right. He heals people. Then he goes by himself. Then he reengages as he goes to the next place of need. Mm. To me, there's like a pattern. Mm. Mm. And I think that's a pattern that I'm trying to wrestle with to figure out how do I make sense of that particular pattern for my own life? And how do you make, um, how do you make sense of that pattern for your own life from the church, right? The religious community, I think it's very intentional and important to think you got to have a religious community or spiritual community to the household, to the community, to the solitude, and then to the next unfamiliar, whatever it is, the unfamiliar. Yeah. I like it. So that's what's resonating with me in this. And uh, this has been fun kind of coming in here and doing something different. Mm, you know, it. y'all been, y'all like it? It's good. Well, if y'all want to, on Tuesdays at two o'clock, that's when we normally record. You can just come in. Jeff, we got, can we do, can we set up like a, like a little studio seating? Be like a Maury Povich show. Yeah. A Maury Povich show. Maury. The Maury show, and I have the envelope. That's great. And it's like, you are not the dad. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. Well, hey, thank you all for coming and uh, being a part of this. It's really, it's really good. I think the, you know, if the one goal that we have is trying to expand this, um, this whole conversation outside the walls of this church, and mm-hmm. digital does this. So people who are listening online, share this podcast with people that you care about because we really are intentionally thinking about not just who's in the room or not just who's inside the church. We're trying to think about talking to people who are outside as well. That's right. The kind of questions and concerns or fears or experiences that they've had as well mm-hmm. as they, as we intersect with scripture, how do we get that to a broader audience in a way that's receptive to say, okay, I'm hearing this in a new way. And we've seen that happen with people yeah. already That's right. Um, from from different aspects of, yeah. of life and community. So, all right. Well, I'm John Stevens. And I'm Matt Russell. And this is Pod Have Mercy. Mm-hmm.